Okay, so we're meeting today, obviously, and then again on Thursday. But Thanksgiving week, I'm giving you guys the whole week off. We're not going to do anything. Um, so no Tuesday? No. No, I just want you guys to have the week. I want me to have the week. I don't, I'm still debating whether I'm going to stay home alone or go join the fam. I don't know, man. <laughs> I got to see if we're going to go even say hello to my sister <laughs> yeah. or not. This whole COVID thing is just so freaky. And um, her kids, my, my sister's kids, their school has had like three cases. And so we got to be very careful around the little ones. Yeah. And, it's, and that's hard when you have little ones because they don't have the awareness or self-control an adult's gonna have what's a mask <laughs> well yeah and how can you not hug i, I totally want to touch everything and lick my hand <laughs> right so i don't know i may maybe i'll go to the desert that would be a good thanksgiving Ooh, that'd be awesome <laughs> that would be some good social distancing <laughs> yeah yeah maybe i'll do that i'm actually speaking at a men's retreat outside of barstow this weekend um, it's a little town called Hinkley. I don't know if you ever saw that Erin Brock, Brockovich movie where she's an attorney fighting PG&E because they dumped all these toxins into the groundwater. And at this church in Hinkley, I spoke there a couple years ago. And what freaked me out the most was when I went in the bathroom, there's these really bold signs above the sink that says, do not drink this water. And it's still to this day, they have to bring in water from the outside because all their water has been poisoned. I, I'm not sure. Poisoned with gonna, what exactly? Do you, do you know? Probably some heavy metals or something. Um, something that would cause birth defects or cancer. Or... When I lived in Wisconsin, our water slowly started getting grosser. And then one day I tasted it. I'm like, why do I taste sulfur? Because oh, I just oh, went through chemistry. Right, <laughs> and he's got right. to smell sulfur. <laughs> Time to start drinking Perrier at, at that stage. Well, eventually we got a water softener and that got rid of the sulfur, but right, <laughs> it still tastes like sulfur without that softener. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're supposed to drink water softener <laughs> water because it's got all that salt in it. That's what makes it soft. Really? Yeah. You have to add salt. So it's like Dasani. Oh, does that have salt in it? I didn't know that. Dasani, they have this really neat trick where they literally look at the, a la the label of a Dasani water bottle once. It will say sodium chloride on it because it will make you feel quenched. But then five minutes later, you're going to get thirsty. So you're like, oh, I need another one. I need another one. I need another one. And it uh, goes uh, on and on and on and on. Well, that's good marketing, I guess. Okay, any my, prayer request? My brother told me that, and I totally you thought guys... he was nuts until I looked at the back of the label. I'm like, wait a minute, this is salt. <laughs> I would appreciate prayer from my back still. I'm. It's getting to a point where it's, I'm having a hard time functioning. Just, It's weird, the connection between your body and your mind. Have you had an MRI to check for like a disc problem or something? No, no, the chiropractor is the only thing I've done so far. Hmm. I have another appointment tomorrow, and I'm hoping that one will last a little longer. I'm hoping Hopefully they'll I get, get you like an MRI to see if you have a disc problem, because that's surgical if it's a disc problem. Right. Yeah. You should know if it's a disc problem. <laughs> like, you can't know that without an MRI, but... Yeah. Well, and the good know, thing about a back MRI is they have like one where you don't have to like go all the way in that you just sit there and like it's like all open it's really cool <laughs> well if this guy doesn't work that will probably be my next move but yeah I'd appreciate prayer for my back and um, as I speak next weekend can be meaningful to the men all right anyone else all right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and these students, the class. Um, I need mercy on my back, please. And um, 
trying to learn from the pain, but I sure am thankful. I've been pain free most of my life. <laughs> I'd like to get back there if possible. Amen. All right. So I, I, the last two classes, I think I just asked you to watch some pre recorded lectures. And hopefully you did that because today I'd like to just talk about those philosophers instead of like teaching on them. I just kind of want to know if any of them resonated with you. And it's weird to me because it's, I don't personally believe in reincarnation, but it's almost like Plato and Aristotle keep getting reincarnated throughout history. It's so weird because St. Augustine just completely embraced Platonic philosophy, even though he was a Christian and then made this, I think, delightful hybrid between Platonic philosophy and Christianity. And it works for me. Um, I know some Christians might think it's like a tainting or stuff of the gospel, but I don't see any tainting of the gospel. I just think it gives you a philosophical structure in which to think even bigger thoughts about God. And to me, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I don't think Plato was a Christian. Um, he was before Christ, for one thing. Um, but I think he had an incredible amount of insight and wisdom. But so did freaking Aristotle. Holy cow. I mean, the guy was like a living encyclopedia. His, his mind was just so precise. And um, even though he was coming at it from a different angle, he has very similar overall views as Plato in, in that they both believe there's like a hierarchy. Um, they both believe there's a spiritual world and a physical material world. So they're dualistic in that sense. Um, they both believe the soul will outlive or transcend the body, that your existence does not end at death. Um, their, their focus was simply different. Plato was starting with the ideal and working down to the concrete, the physical. And Aristotle, of course, is starting with the physical, working up to the ideal. And so there, to me, it's really just two sides to the same coin. It's just a different emphasis. I, I don't see them like this. I see them more like this. And um, that, that's my take on the two of them. Um, but then when we get to the 12th century, we have Thomas Aquinas is a virtual Aristotelian devotee. And he, he weds Aristotelian logic and reason and physics, metaphysics with Christianity. And all of a sudden, we now have a much more rational rather than a mystical Christianity, um, much more open to like reason and um, apologetic arguments based on reason and data. And it's also the birth time in the Renaissance of modern science, um, all the way back to Copernicus. If you remember Copernicus, do you remember what was his claim to fame, Christina? Remember what he discovered that was so shocking to everyone or what he said that was so shocking I can't remember. I do remember the name, though. He taught a heliocentric solar system. That the sun was the center of the solar system, not the Earth. And he got a lot of flack. How did I not that. remember that? Yeah. <laughs> and then and I Galileo, think, I think, said the Earth was the center of the universe, right? No. Galileo, about I think he's about 150 years or so after Copernicus, he also verified what Copernicus said and by Who this said the time, earth was the center of the universe there was someone before Copernicus well that was the general belief of everybody in Europe that the earth was the center and Copernicus was the first one in modern times to challenge it and then Galileo I think 150 years or so later I'd have to check the dates of those two guys but the telescope had been discovered and he discovered moons around Jupiter. And that changed everything. Because 
once he realized there were things orbiting around other bodies and not everything was orbiting around the earth, then it gave a lot more credence to what, what Copernicus had said. And so Galileo really challenged the idea of a terracentric solar system where the earth is the center and, and advocated for a heliocentric universe that the sun is the center. And what that did though was it moved man out of this central important place of being at the center of God's universe. And so if you can imagine, if you're coming from a religious perspective and you thought planet Earth was the end all be all, and now all of a sudden these scientists are saying, actually we're quite small and actually everything's not revolving around us. And actually um, our reason is limited and we can only know a little bit about reality. And all of these things kind of diminished man instead of like the biblical view where we're like the crowning jewel of God's terrestrial creation, we now become just another one of the beast, right? Um, a more advanced beast, but we're, there's no more pearly gates and, and stuff. It's, it's now just the stars and, and science is, as science grows and blossoms in this time period, um, it becomes hostile to religion. And it's interesting because as we enter into this modern period, and once again, it's weird because we're talking 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries is the modern period in philosophy. But we would think of those as like old history, right? From, from our contemporary standard. But in that modern period, um, you have a huge shift and science, which used to be under the umbrella of philosophy, um, now takes off on its own and actually becomes hostile towards philosophy. It's interesting, even to this day, some of the most knocked down drag them out arguments I have is with um, scientists who think philosophy is just a waste of time and we're just doing pipe dreams in our head and we're not contributing anything to society and look at all the things science has done. And I just, I just laugh because they, they don't have any perspective or understanding where science came from or how it developed. And it actually came from these philosophers. Who were like, I wonder if they got that quote from the good place, the show. That's why everyone hates moral philosophy professors. <laughs> I, I laughed so hard at that because it was so me. To, yeah, everything could and be a moral time, she's like, I know, we suck. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, I try not to get into argument with scientists. But I think the first two people in the first video was John Locke and George Barclay. Mm -hmm. And once again, it's freaking Plato and Aristotle all over again. Barclay is the idealist like Plato he believes all reality is in your mind and we're like a projector and we're actually projecting the world we're walking through. It's almost like a conveyor belt. Um, did any of you see Stephen King's movie, The Langoliers? Um, to, it's kind of like that movie in that um, as time moves forward, you're going into the future and it's, being created before you and the past is like dissipating and going away behind and so reality is happening in this in this short little span of time but yesterday is gone and tomorrow isn't here and we're and that movie it's a sci-fi movie where they get it's a plane gets caught in a thunderstorm and when they land in the airport something had happened where they didn't land in their right time. They landed, they landed up here ahead on the conveyor belt. And so things weren't, they hadn't appeared fully yet. They, they were in the process of becoming. And then they thought, we got to get out of here. Something's wrong. And they got back on the plane. And when they landed again, I think they landed after time and the world was breaking apart before their eyes because they weren't in 
time anymore. And so it, that was tripping me out and it really made me think of Barclay's philosophy. When I first learned about him, I just, all of a sudden my whole world became like a conveyor belt. And I realized I'm, as I walk into a room or I'm driving down the highway or I go into a classroom, reality is materializing before my eyes. But when I close the door or when things fade in my rear view mirror, they're gone. And Barclay's critics, of course, were like, Barclay, for heaven's sakes, we know lots of things continue to exist even when we can't see them. And remember his little jingle was perception equals reality. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. Well, I, if you've ever got an email from me, that's my sign off. Um, I love Barclay. And I think he's right. Perception, it's at least your reality. If it's not everyone else's, it's your reality, what you're perceiving. So that's true. And um, so his critics were just like, come on, man. We know that even though we can only see, I think I use the example of a frog sitting by a river. And even though he can only see this much of the river, water's coming from somewhere and it's going somewhere. Even though we can't see it, we can infer water's not just happening in this little stretch that we can see. And <clears throat> Barclay used this to do kind of like a reverse fakey on the materialist empiricist scientist who said, we can only know what we can see. Um, basically, sense perception is the basis for truth and knowledge. And so Barclay used that to explain to them that everything that you see in the world or especially the things you can't see, but you know that they're there, like the dark side of the moon, um, are there because God perceives them. And it is God's perception that keeps the world in existence, not yours, not mine, but God's. And God sees all things all the time. And God's capital P perception is capital R reality. And so that's Barclay. And his counterpoint, John Locke, is just like, no, no, we're not projecting reality. Don't be ridiculous. Reality's out there. It's already been made. And we're like, we have like a screen in our head. And reality is being projected from the real world into our minds. Barclay's saying it's our minds <laughs> projecting reality out into the world. I love it. And so John Locke is saying we're basically born with this tabula rasa, this blank slate. And as sense perceptions come in, it's data that goes on that board of our mind. And then we can use reason to rearrange things and to come up with new. Like, for example, your mama could say, um, don't play in the street. It's dangerous. And you're like, OK. But then one day. You might see, you might lose your basketball and it goes over the fence into the street and you see a car come by and smack it, right? And you can use your reason now to, to take street, you can take ball, you can take car, and then you can think, oh, my mama told me not to play in the street because it was danger. And now you can use your reason to think, you know, my head's about the same shape as the basketball. I wonder if the same thing would happen to it in the street with the car and maybe I should listen to my mama. But that's Locke's world that we start with nothing, we're blank slates and then we get data coming in through our senses and then we use our reason to use that data to come up with new ideas and arrangements. Barclay is like, nope, just like Plato, he's saying everything you could possibly ever know is already within you and it's now just a matter of bringing that forth, projecting that into the world. So there's a quick overview of those two. I'm curious, obviously I've given myself away. I'm obviously in the Plato Barclay camp and um, he was actually a, the, the Bishop of Canterbury, Archbishop. 
So interesting. Locke carried a lot of weight and we didn't really get into his political philosophy, but he's the, he's the whole guy talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of private property. That was John Locke. Now, the, the Americans, when they were doing the Federalist Papers and trying to write up the Constitution, they relied heavily on the philosophy of John Locke. They were really taken by him. But they changed his little mantra from life, liberty, and the pursuit or the possession of private property to the pursuit of happiness. I don't know why they did that, but um, remember at that time period, private property, land, is what gave you status. Land equaled power because land produced wealth, um, security, etc. That was beginning to change as um, the guilds and free market capitalism started to come into vogue. And it went from land being what determined who was powerful and important to capital, who had cash on hand. And people with capital could buy land. People with capital could buy titles. People with capital could buy information and resources, right? So it went from land-based power to capital-based power. But it's changing now. Um, do you know where power is based now? It's no longer in land. It's How much no money you have. No, it's no longer in capital. It's something else. We've moved into a different era. It's what I spend probably a quarter of my income on acquiring every month. Social status? <laughs> nope. Um, you really can't say what age you're in while you're in it. You have to kind of wait for future historians to give you your title. But a lot of people have labeled us as being in the information age. And now instead of land or money, what you know, it's yeah, access to information. That's where the power is now. And like I said, I spend a quarter of my income every month on accessing information. Whether that's high speed internet, um, satellite TV. Um, I'm a member of a couple societies, um, different groups. And it's important to me because of what I do, my job, I need to stay aware. I need to keep up. And it's all contemporary stuff, right? Because the philosophy has virtually been unchanged since the ancient Greek times, as you can see. It's just a repackaging of what the Greeks already kind of went through. And okay, anyways, I want to stop talking. I think I should give my back a break. Okay, so talk to me. Which one of those guys did you like best and why? Or or did you like them both? Or parts of both each of them? Um, I, I just like to hear from you guys. They both that, obviously have value. Oh, yeah. sure. Most definitely. It's just crazy. I think that like listening on both of them and their ideas from it, I was just it was just so real because they both had truth to them. Um, but I forgot the name of the philosopher that was like, it's like both of their ideas are correct. Yeah, that's Kant. Kant, and, and that we'll like, get to him in a minute. But I just want to think about these two guys first. Oh, okay. Then, yes, yeah, because I, what Kant I did, I like, I like both of them. What Kant did was truly exceptional. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what did Kant do, Carlos? Go he ahead. Did, what, he, he, he got both of their ideas and said, like, they're both correct. Yes. Um, and it's, like, it's the bigger whole. It's the bigger whole, basically. But like, uh, and what what and this really like through the time like, <laughs> um, so 
so there is a lot going on with my family and mm -hmm. so <clears throat> in the past month like my both my cousins passing away um there was a lot of like political stuff just a lot of emotions so they're coming back from like these true like these little are realities mm -hmm. but i i just sat back and listened to them and i was like i didn't know how to comprehend it and then explain it to them in a way until listening to the lectures that like our little our realities doesn't mean it's like or like our little p perceptions is a little our reality and then god is like the big our reality and it's beyond that we need to understand that right Amen. Amen. and, and to me we're... that is part of the great beauty of philosophy it just keeps expanding my concept of god mm -hmm. theology actually gave me a very nice informed view of god but it really was in a box yeah and um, as I began to view God more through a philosophic lens, I realized the box just explodes. And yeah, those qualities and characteristics that we know about God are true and real. I'm not saying they're not, but God is so much more than that. And that's what I just love the mystery. But because I'm a philosopher, I can't stop thinking about like, I, on my, I took a trip this weekend up to some healing hot springs, which was the worst thing apparently I could have done. Apparently, you're not supposed to put heat on this kind of injury. It's supposed to be ice. And he goes, how did you feel the next day? And I said, like, I was going to die. And he said, yep. <laughs> That's, you got the blood flowing all through that stuff. And then he says, you, you want ice. You want to contract stuff, not expand it right now. So. Anyways, while I was up there, um, I asked my buddy about if he thought we would eat in heaven. You know, if, if we'd be able to eat with our glorified bodies. And he was just like, oh, yeah, of course. I'm, but then my next question is, if you eat, you're going to have to poop. And it just seems weird to think about poop in heaven, right? And um, <laughs> and my friend was like really annoyed with me. He's like, why do you even think about stuff like that? And I'm just like, <laughs> I can't help it. It's just kind of how I'm wired. Because I'm assuming if there's a wedding feast of the lamb, we're going to be eating and drinking which means even if we have glorified bodies, that material substance has to go somewhere. Unless we're just going to have like methane farts that smell like flowers <laughs> or something. I don't know. <laughs> now, I don't think... Another idea is that it maybe just evaporates. Maybe. Like yeah, it are we going to have never... internal organs? Are we going to have genitalia? I mean... <sighs> Will there be sex in heaven? I mean, it's just. <laughs> he was actually more annoyed by that question. I don't know why. But, uh... I think it's like, for me, I think when, when, when the quarantine hit and I finally had time to like, just lay off school, not school, but just like my social life. And I was able to like process my actual life. I started thinking just at like more and more and more and i just started getting to the point where i was like oh i don't even know what am i why do i even come up with this stuff like how did i even get to this but it's cool i like it <laughs> okay well let's let's move to kant a little so kant is basically going all the way back to plato and aristotle he's the first philosopher willing to try to tackle this idealism realism split that has gone all the way to the 18th century in philosophy. Unbelievable. Because Kant's writing about the time of the American Revolution, late 1700s. And German philosopher, Prussian, and he comes up with this distinction between phenomena <laughs> and noumena. Love it. Oh my gosh. And phenomena is the world as it appears. So everything you're seeing or perceiving is the phenomenal world. But Kant maintains 
there is a reality behind that or beyond that. And he calls that the noumenal world, which is things as they actually are. But he makes it very clear, humans cannot see or perceive the noumenal world because we're humans. And we perceive the world through human senses, human eyes, ears, nose, mouth, touch. And because of that, we get, it's like a human filter. When we go for a walk in the mountains or the woods, or we go sailing, we're doing it through a human worldview or perspective. An animal is going to have a very different experience. Even your dog, if you go on a hike with your dog, the world your dog is experiencing on that hike and the world you're experiencing on that hike are not the same world. Wild. I, I use, I think I use the example in the video of like bats or pit vipers. Um, pit vipers um, have infrared gr glands on their um, sides of their faces and they pick up heat signatures and their minds, their brains translate that into images. And it's wild. Well, we use our eyes. They're using these sensors that we don't have as humans. So how they're perceiving reality is going to be very different. Uh, if you were a bat, you would be chirping. You would be using sonar. You would be using sound to create images in your brain of what's going on. And humans, we primarily use our eyes, but we can also make images with our nose, with our um, ears, with our taste. You know, they can bring and conjure up certain things into our mind that is interpreted in our brain. So what Kant is saying is they're both correct because Barclay is correct in the sense that there is this one unchangeable world, but humans, as we interact with this world, we bring our perspective or our perceptions to play on it. So we are actually ordering the world through our perspective, the worlds in which we live. But he said, Locke is also correct in that there is an actual world out there and we're using sense perceptions to bring things into our mind. But I think the brilliance of Kant here is he's getting away from that Aristotelian law of non-contradiction, that either or sort of thinking and this is a much more Eastern way of thinking and it's inclusive. And instead of him picking one side and rejecting the other, he embraces both and then he looks for where they meet or something that can incorporate both of them together. And so what he's doing is basically saying, since we can't know the noumenal world we should focus on what we can know, the phenomenal world. Now that's not denying the noumenal world exists, but remember back to Descartes' chart of the mind-body distinction? Kant saying, we can deal with the physical side of it. We can measure it, we can test it, we can corroborate with each other what we're perceiving, but we can't deal with this side because it's beyond this physical material realm, it's spirit. And so we're not denying its existence, but how are we supposed to incorporate that as humans into our philosophy, into our thinking? So let's focus on what we can know, which is the material, physical, and then respectfully decline to engage with the metaphysical. And this is part of where you now get a rift between theology and philosophy. Before, as you notice through the medieval period, they were the same. And now there's this pulling away tension. And then you'll see hostility. Yeah, apart from the hard scientists, the other most confrontational people I have are religious people who have a real problem with philosophy. And um, it's all right. Now, that's absolutely crazy because, I mean, he actually has a very valid point. And I mean, you can see it in the Bible. What point is that? 
Wait. Uh, so when when we look about like the Garden of Eden, so God's like, hey, um, I'm gonna put two uh, cherubim here, and uh, it won't be visible anymore. I mean, it's still there. It's just we can't see it. You think the Garden of Eden's still there? Yeah, but it's something that we physically can't see or wow i never heard that before yeah i just i think it is um when all that happened way back when that god's like hey this will no longer be visible and now it's just this like fourth dimension that we cannot see it's still there you know we've had we a worldwide see. flood since then right yeah <laughs> i'm just checking yeah. Do you think the tree of life and knowledge of good and evil are there? No. Well, well I was. Well, um, if it still exists, is what I mean. Oh, the tree I, of life still exists. Yeah, absolutely. I know it still exists in heaven, but if Wayne's insinuating that the Garden of Eden is still there somewhere, so you think it's like somewhere? I want to know a where he thinks it is and b. Well, no, what I'm saying is it's not in a physical realm anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, then, I like Kant, I really can't talk about it. If that was the Perception point you were making. Perception equals reality. <laughs> if that's the point you were making, good point. I personally think we're actually driving with the Garden of Eden every day. Every time you fill up your fuel tank, you're you're driving on the remains of Eden. Where where was Eden? Where did the four rivers meet? It was in the Middle East. Where no, all where? I've always wondered where, because every are. time I've looked at a map, I can't find a spot where Tigris, Euphrates, Pishon, and Pihon meet. That's because two of those rivers do not exist today. And remember, and that was given before the flood. Yeah, so the flood. Things would have changed radically mm, but so we don't the genesis account was written after the flood and so whoever wrote that i'm assuming moses is trying to tell you basically where it was so is there I'm a place where the euphrates and the tiger server meet because those two rivers still exist right today. so you're i'm assuming those other two rivers would have been somewhere in the vicinity and so you're looking at Eden being somewhere in like that Saudi Arabian peninsula um, where Iran, Iraq are, ancient Persia, modern day Iran. So that's where you think it is? It would have been? if it. Yeah, absolutely. Or I, I really in think Wayne's the view, the invisible... Or what happened to Eden. My view and... is that God just simply took Eden away during the flood. And oh. it's in heaven. That, that, that's my theory, but... I don't know. Wayne's theory is kind of, kind of cool. I respect his theory too, but my theory is that God just took it up and took it to heaven, and now it's just a plain field. Well, <laughs> if someone only, figured out where it was, it's just a field. <laughs> I don't think the tree of knowledge of good and evil is mentioned anymore in the Bible, but the tree of life certainly is. And tree of life's it, in heaven. You find it in heaven, and we get to eat of it. Oh my God! I'm, I, I can hardly wait. To also, the river of life, and and some scholars believe it's also a type or a um, allusion to Christ, and that was Christ in the garden was the tree of life, but they chose knowledge over Jesus, and um, but I don't know that's an allegorical interpretation, but I think it's interesting. But I, I do believe before, it's a I'm real a very tree. literalist. So I believe there was a physical tree that the fruit would have let you live, allowed you to live forever. Yeah, and I do a too. physical tree. I do <laughs> that, too. That's just, that's just I don't my think it's, I'm a very literalist. I don't think it's metaphysical in the fourth dimension. I think it's a real tree we can touch and eat the Same fruit. Same with the river of life. It's a, it's a real river that we will be able to look and touch the water. Yeah, or if someone would mind water, looking up that yeah. passage of the Tree of Life in Revelation, it's so beautiful. I, I would love to share I'd that. I'd love to see that. Because there, there's, there's a, a river that's flowing. It's, it sounds like the tree is straddling a river. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God. <laughs> I can hardly wait. 
I'm getting all emotional just thinking about it. There's an animated show that tried to depict heaven, and for some reason, they decided to depict the river of life as a water, starting at God's throne as a waterfall. Yes. Coming out of God's throne, like God was powering the water, and then the water flowed through heaven. I love it. Well, that's right out of the Bible. It's right out of the Bible. And then there's that, there's the teaching, um, oh my goodness. I got to preach on this. It was where um, Jesus declared that um, he he was the living water, and mm-hmm. and I didn't realize, but that was part of the temple ceremony where they would bring this this jug of water out and they would pour it down and it would flow down the steps of the temple. And it and was today, at baptism that point of the ceremony, new Christians in water, <laughs> right? That Jesus got up there on the temple steps and declared that He was the water, and mm-hmm. and everyone they probably threw like, rocks at him. <laughs> what? And then, if you look back, I believe it's in Ezekiel. I'll have to find the passage, but it's a description of the temple when when God has re-entered it, and it says water is pouring out from the temple flowing down the steps and it's going in every direction and it's just that's a revelation but it could be no that's an ezekiel that passage did you find the one in revelation William? actually no i was looking up my theory uh in oh, genesis Rhea has it I got will you it. read it to us Rhea? absolutely autumn are you here yeah i am okay good she was I can having help problems earlier class. today too. She had her camera on in my, our first class, but I, I can help you, Autumn, with registration after class if you want. Cool, perfect. Okay, good. Let us have it, Ray. You're muted. Oh, mute. <laughs> I would help a little. Sorry about that. <laughs> Just a little. Okay. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was a tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations. And there was to be, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Mm. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them life, and they shall reign forever and ever. Love it. So good. Trees in heaven. I'm so happy. I do think we'll have some sort of stomach or some sort of I do believe we'll be able to. Yeah, I do Why would God talk just, about trees oh, and fruit if he doesn't want us to enjoy them? <laughs> right. My my only point is, and I'm not trying to be crude or crass, it's just I only know things from an earthly physiological standpoint. And when you eat material, it has to go somewhere. And I don't know I don't know if in heaven that's different Be- because our whole life is based on things have to die so that other things can live, right? And in heaven, it's not that way. Um, Speaking of Eden, life isn't dependent on the death of the old, but here on earth, that's how it works. I got a question for you. What do you believe would have happened if Adam and Eve decided to ignore the serpent and not eat the fruit? Wouldn't that make a great Christian fiction novel? Um, and, and in fact, C.S. Lewis did one, uh, and it was called Perilandra. And I've it read was, that. It was based on Mars. Christian lit. Right. Sarnowski makes us read that, yeah. And the Adam and Eve prototypes on that creation didn't listen to the serpent, and they got to go on in blessedness, right? because they chose to obey God. And I, I, I like that. I think another interesting fictional story would be, what if Adam simply refused to go along with Eve? 
And then when God showed up, he can just say, God, I don't know what happened. The woman got deceived. What if Adam had me? Or another version of the question is, what if Adam didn't eat the fruit and Eve did? Or what if Eve didn't, but Adam ate the You know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's what I just said, Chris. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. And that could be a great novel, right? That Eve gets kicked out of the garden starts her own ungodly race of people and god takes another rib and and does like a eve 2.0 and and adam gets to try again i don't know it, it would be fun speculative novels there there actually is a a version of that where eve is actually the second wife of adam she's not the first wife you guys know who the first wife was? Orpah? You ever hear of Lilith? I just said first wife. Penelope just said it. <laughs> Good for you, Penelope. <laughs> <laughs> She's dancing around. So yeah, Lilith. And supposedly she was Adam's first wife, but when God told told her that Adam was her head and she was needed to be submissive to him. She was like, forget that. Um, <laughs> no one's the boss of me. And she ends up procreating with the serpent and creating her own line of humans. And then Adam and Eve, of course, mess up and get kicked out of the garden. And now they're having to compete with this, this other evil line of people in the world. Have you ever seen the movie Noah? Yeah. Okay. I think this is completely nuts, but like, do you remember like the descent, the city, like the the king of like the city that Noah was living by? Mm -hmm. He was supposedly a descendant of Cain mm -hmm. because Noah is a descendant of, I think it was Seth. Yes, that's correct. I just think it's crazy how Cain's descendants went off to be horrible people. I mean, even the Bible says this, but... Yes, it said the entire world was covered in violence and every, imagin every imagination in their heart. And I know we're pretty bad today in a lot of ways, but I don't know anyone whose every thought is violence or perversion or, uh -uh. you know... It, it's, just, it's just horrific to imagine a society like that. I hate that one verse where God's like, I am sad I ever made, grieved that I ever made them. That I know, what a horrible cry. thing for God to say. He was actually grieved that he had made humans. And we were made in his image. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, sad so, to think of him thinking that, you know? Or well, saying, he you. didn't think it, he said it. That was a fun little detour, but let's go back to Kant. Sorry. It's all right. No, it's not your fault. I did. I started it uh, with all my weird theology speculation. But Kant saying, let's not speculate on if if Adam could have had another wife or all this stuff. He's like, let's focus on what we can know, what we can verify. And so Kant definitely believes in God, but he also believes that these supernatural claims can't be verified or repeated. Go ahead, Rhea. You're on mute. There you go. Does he believe that the nominal world can interact with the phenomenal world? Or does he believe that they're in like essentially separate spheres and don't touch each other? No, it's the same world. It's simply what you're perceiving is the phenomena because you can't perceive the noumena. Okay. There's only one world for Kant. Okay. Okay. It's a matter of perception. So he doesn't believe, he believes that if you were able to perceive something, it would be only part of the nominal world. It would not be a phenomenal world. I'm just asking because like as Christians, we believe that the Holy Spirit does come and live in us, interact with us. We believe that Jesus was like the ultimate, you know, epitome of combination of, you know, phenomenal and nominal or nominal. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious what his thoughts on were on like Christian, Christian thoughts like that. Did you believe that that was just impossible? Or did you believe that those things 
because you could perceive it were part of the phenomenal world. Anything you can perceive is part of the phenomenal world. If there was some way you could perceive the nominal world, you wouldn't be able to talk about it. Or you'd have to talk about it in metaphors and parables and allegories because there wouldn't be any way to communicate it to other people. You'd have to use something that they could perceive to try to describe something they couldn't perceive. And there you got the Bible, right? A lot of the prophecy, a lot of the stuff. It's You have these prophets saying, holy cow, I just had this vision. And I'm going to try to explain it to you in ways you can understand. But whatever they were seeing was beyond normal physical perception because it was like being spiritually perceived. It was like a revelation. So I guess, Rhea, in that sense, you could kind of say revelations are sort of numinal if they're coming directly from God. But even then, as we as humans begin to perceive the revelation, we start to bring it into our sheath of perception. Does that make sense? It's the same with the Bible. Even if you believe the Bible is 100% divinely inspired, given by God, every jot and tittle is how God wanted it, the moment you begin to interact with it, it starts passing through the Rhea filter, or the Carlos filter, or the, the Wayne filter. And th that's, that's just the nature of humans, right? And Kant just wants us to be able to think clearly and critically about the world because he believes reason is the way to know knowledge and truth. And his point about this is you can't trust your sense perceptions because that's all they are. They're perspectival. And um, you're, you need to trust your reason because that will give you knowledge regardless of distorted sense perception of the world reason can take you there your eyesight can't and so he wrote a book called the critique of pure reason <laughs> it's about this big it's brutal man uh, that's probably one of the hardest books i was ever asked to read in college and i probably understood maybe 15 20 percent of it and i don't know it, it was just a workout but I could see his point. Um, and then he wrote a companion volume called The Critique of Practical Reason. Like how do you apply pure reason into everyday activities of the world? And when he gets to writing his ethical theory, he makes a really bold claim. And he says, the only good thing in the world, and he's talking about good in and of itself, not like a utilitarian good, but something that is good in and of itself, there is only one thing, and that is pure practical reason. Because wealth could be good or it could destroy you. Beauty could be good or it could be used to entice. Strength could be good or you could use it to harm others. But pure practical reason is always going to be good because it's always going to be used correctly because it's rational, reasonable. Now, I totally disagree with Kant on his conclusion, but I loved how he did that both and with Barclay and Locke. And basically what he ended up doing was opening the door to postmodernism because now people are getting out of this either or sort of mentality and they're thinking, oh, Look what Kant did with Plato and Aristotle, basically. He creates a both and where it's not like this, but they're like this. And could we do that with other things? And hence we enter into the postmodern world where we get a, a more of a both and approach 
And think about it. Think in your own lives. If someone gives you a choice or an option and they're saying like, okay, here's your choices. You can either do this or you can do that. And usually when people give me those sort of diametrically opposed choices, the first thing I ask is, are there any other options? Because usually those two choices aren't good, right? They're, they're going to be bad in some way. And so I always am looking for a third option or a, a different approach if it's available. I hate being presented with an either or choice. Okay. Um, another thing of note about Kant. Oh, it's already three. Wow. Um, he was raised by like religious fanatics of the more charismatic persuasion. So if you can imagine these 18th century or 19th century holy rollers in Germany jumping and shouting and rolling down the aisles and Kant it just can't take it. And so he wants to <clears throat> he wants to have a religion or a way of life that isn't like a roller coaster. Because that's how his church was. When things were going good, God loved you. When things were going bad, either the devil was out to get you or the God was punishing you. And then when things went good, God was shining his face on you. And it was just Kant wanted a more steady, even rational approach to life right not this six flags magic mountain thrill ride he wanted a little more consistency and so i think you know i'm not a psychologist but if i was going to be doing a psychological profile on kant i think a lot of his philosophy is a reaction to his upbringing what a surprise can't imagine how that happens Ugh. I'm doing the tennis ball treatment if you're wondering at my weird gyrations. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, it cracks me up because Kant wants this very tame, calm, rational religion. You know, that's reason based. He doesn't want feeling because feels are going to mess you up. You want to go with your reason over your heart. And, um, he was, he was a bit of a type A personality. He would go for a morning walk every day in Konigsberg, his college town, and people would actually set their clocks to when he went by their house. He was that precise in his little routine. And um, I, I think he's he might be the most brilliant human that's ever lived on the planet. Um, not to not to denounce Solomon's wisdom, but Solomon got his wisdom from directly from God, right? It was like a supernatural thing. And and Kant, I would say, ultimately got his wisdom from God, but he's he's really using human means to do it. He's not going through revelation or illumination. Um, he does believe in God, but to him, I, I almost get the impression that God's over here and we really can't know him. He's real, but Let's focus over here on stuff we can know, we can demonstrate, we can test, we can study. And hence we get this split between science, philosophy, and religion. You know, it's, it's really interesting at this time. We have kind of this fracturing. And philosophy, which used to be like the... Um, the queen of the sciences, everything was under the umbrella of philosophy. One by one, these little subshoots or sections jettison and have become their own disciplines over the years. But if you go back to ancient Greek times, everything was under philosophy, music, math, um, gymnasium, history. You know, it, it, all, it all was tied together. But it makes sense. All right. Any more questions about Kant? I love his name too, Emmanuel. Who calls their kid Emmanuel? God with us, Kant. I love it. I, he's so important that if you can't deal with Kant, I don't think you really 
have the right to to do philosophy personally um like if you're writing modern philosophy and you haven't understood how Kant dealt with the difference between the idealist and the materialist, between Plato and Aristotle, between Berkeley and Locke, between Aquinas and Augustine, um, he's so pivotal that all kind of philosophic history kind of culminates in Kant. And then after Kant, we get a whole new type of thinking in the West. Is that kind of like, it kind of brings you to like, um, I think it was the philosopher Hegel. Was it Hegel that said that like, it goes like this and it kind of sprouts out like that. What, Geist? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what we'll talk about on Thursday. We'll talk about Hegel. Wow. And Marx and Kierkegaard. <laughs> Woo, I'm excited. So I hope to see you all on Thursday at two, and we'll talk about those three guys. Um, I'm going to give you Thanksgiving week off, so we won't do any live streaming for that. And then we'll have, I think, four more classes when we come back from break. And I'll probably give you one of those to do your final and the other three. I'll look at the book at some of the more contemporary philosophers, because um, there's some that would be fun to talk about. I'd like to talk about Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and um, some of the existentials. But with the whole Black Lives Movement and people talking about um, critical theory, I'd really like you to know what that is. And so you can be informed and, and be aware. Because it is true. There, there is a lot of critical theory involved in the Black Lives Movement matter, at least certain factions of it. And I like to call it like Marxism light. Um, but it definitely is coming from a Marxist um, worldview perspective. And just quickly, usually I don't give my opinions, but I love critical theories observations because they're basically the people saying, follow the money, see who's benefiting from the way the system is right now. That's going to tell you who's in control or who are you not allowed to criticize that kind of tells you who's in control. And I, I agree with all of those observations. It's their solutions I disagree with because it's a Marxist solution. And I'm not a Marxist, I'm a Christian. And the Marxist solution is you have to take it to the streets. Um, people are not gonna give up their power or piece of the pie willingly. If you want a better life for you or your family, you have to make it. There's no sweet by and by. Jesus ain't going to intervene for you. So stop whining and pick up your pitchfork and make a difference. And that's that's not how I roll. <laughs> I, I'm looking for a conversion of the heart. And um, I agree with their critiques of the imbalance and the horrible way certain people and segments of our population have been treated. And it absolutely has to change. But I don't want to change it through Marxism. I want to change it through Jesus. All right. <laughs> that's, another, that's my little sermonette to end class. But, um, but yeah, I'm not going to throw the whole Black Lives Movement out the window just because some of them are attached to critical theory. But I do want you to know what it is. So after we come back from Thanksgiving, and, and maybe I'm um, Wittgenstein, Oh my gosh, he kind of ruined philosophy in a way because basically philosophy, it makes me think of like the eye of Sauron in the Lord of the Rings that just looks all around the world trying to find stuff and then it focuses on it and just like, Brrr. that's how philosophy is. It can focus on any topic, but what Wittgenstein crazy Wittgenstein did is he turned it on itself <laughs> and now you have philosophy being deconstructed by philosophy and it turns into this like self-referential loop and Wittgenstein got to this point where he he basically said uncle <laughs> we do not we cannot do philosophy we do not have the language or the ability to even 
continue this discipline. And that's the 20th century. Is it is it because like we knew well we had this concept of knowing nothing and we try to know everything and we got to know what well, well, we thought of everything, which is still nothing. See, Wittgenstein would say, whatever you were trying to say to me right now, Carlos, whatever meaning you were trying to communicate, I did not receive it. Because all those words you just used mean different, different things to, to me than um, they mean to you. Um, That's the problem with language, because it's symbolic. And so say good. what you just said again. I mean, those were some great big words. That like, um, well, I, um, oh man, how did they say it? That basically we had an understanding of, or we didn't really know anything um, per se. And we tried through through history, through time, we tried to know everything, but then we got to a point where we thought we knew everything that it's back to like, well, now we know nothing. Right. But if I just took one word at a time, like, and I ask you, what is history? Mm -hmm. what your oh, definition yeah. of history is it's gonna be different from what yours. mine is what yeah. hegel's is what wittgenstein's is are right. going to be four different, different and that's just one word yeah and so wittgenstein is saying we think we're communicating with other people but we're not because what we're saying is not what they're hearing yeah it's true he, so he recommends like the most primal direct type of communication possible because he thinks words require interpretation and social context and all of that. And so he's recommending more like um, caveman talk. Like when, when I take a drink of this refreshing beverage, Oh, mm. now that communicates a thousand times more than if I gave some eloquent thing about the crystalline waters from spring fed pools that I had brought back from the Sierras to quench my thirst. I've, just a simple <sighs> communicates so much more. When you eat something yummy and you go, mmm, <laughs> that's where Wittgenstein says. But I get it. It's it's just like that pure when you're in pain and you go, ah, or when you are in pleasure and you go, oh, it's it's such a profound communication, and it's not using symbolic language. There are sounds involved, but they're not symbolic, they're direct interesting it's so interesting if someone would like to write me a a term paper just just using caveman <laughs> sounds that would be fantastic uh, does it have to be 10 pages though? i'm still waiting for my first all emoji term oh, paper dear. but um it hasn't come yet wouldn't that be fun especially yeah. if they really were communicating concepts using emojis I would just be geeked out. There is a version of the Bible that uses a lot of emojis instead really? of text. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see it. Send me a link if you find one. Okay, all, thanks for showing up. It was nice to see you. Um, I, I must be feeling a little better because this was a fun class for me. I enjoyed talking to you guys. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you have to see me doing all my gyrations, but that's all right. Um, good. I'll see you Thursday. And Autumn, I'm. If you hang in there, I'll get you registered. Yeah. Cool. All right. Take care, you guys. Bye, guys.